So I'll, I'll reiterate again, thank you so much for having us here. We're really excited to talk. My name is Jean Macklem. I'm a bioinformatician at DNA Genotech and with Diversigen. And then I'm here with my colleague, Christina, who's going to be presenting part of the uh, content we have today about de-risking microbiome research and clinical discoveries, robust at-home methods for sample collection, storage, and transport. So it's probably no surprise to anyone here for me to say that microbiome matters and that the associations between our microbes and ourselves are critically important to our health and our environment. With the explosion of microbiome research and high throughput sequencing technologies over the past decade, we've moved from just describing what's there to critical research questions and hypothesis driven studies leading to discoveries. So when we look at the anatomy of a microbiome study, there are critical points of impact that can help or hinder the results that you're trying to achieve for discovery. For the talk today, I'm gonna to touch mostly on these major impact points involving our collection and storage solutions here at DNA Genotech with our OmniGene line of products, and briefly on our end-to-end -end, uh, study design all the way through sequencing and data analytics um, offered from Diversigen. So as mentioned on the previous slide, one critical challenge in any study is being able to acquire the right type and the right number of samples. Uh, in our current global state facing our COVID-19 pandemic as we are, this has become an even larger obstacle to access high quality patient and donor samples. These issues underscore the need for reliable at-home collection options and for being able to store and save samples for short and longer term. A second large challenge of any study, microbiome or otherwise, is preventing the introduction of unwanted bias or noise into your sample process. So in order to generate a microbiome sequence data set, there are a number of steps that your samples have to go through. So from a total bacterial population, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna move my cursor. Um, so from the total bacterial population, a small portion of that sample is taken Usually there's an extraction of the nucleic acids, possibly some amplification. Um, part of that product's put on the library and then eventually to the sequencer. So the two key takeaways from this are one, we're subsampling a very small portion of the original starting material. And two, every step of that process is a potential source of variability. I'm just gonna pause. I'm getting a message about my audio not working. And I apologize, I just want to double check that it is working. Are you fine? Okay, great, sorry, thanks for confirming that. I'm just getting a pop-up from Zoom. Continuing on, <laughs> um, anyone in computing knows this concept very well. The idea that garbage in equals garbage out. So no matter how well you treat the data and no matter what fancy analytics you're applying, if your input is incorrect or poor quality, you're not gonna be able to get the output you want. Um, instead, what you wanna do is turn those precious samples into something more valuable. So sources of variability are broadly either biological. So these are factors in the underlying population such as age, diet, the microbiome complexity, and technical variability. So parts of the process that influence your sample at the end point. So sampling, your PCR primer choice, wet lab reagents, sequencing choice, uh, all impact the technical variability. Ultimately, what we want to avoid is any bias, which are the unwanted variability obscuring that true biological signal. The true biological signal is something called the effect size. And it's the amount of change between the two groups relative to the underlying variability. So as an example on the right, there are two groups plotted here on a PCOA. So one colored black, one colored gray. And the first panel shows a very large effect due to bias. So the two groups are highly separable, but it's almost certainly due to a methodological choice since the differences are so extreme. A large effect a large biological effect in a microbiome study would look more like panel A, where group, the gray group and the black group are highly separable, but still somewhat variable and somewhat overlapping. 
But ultimately, most effects that we're trying to measure in microbiome, so say due to a drug, a disease, a dietary intervention, have very small effects, so more like panel C and D, with very large variation. So therefore, as much as possible, you don't want to introduce additional, vari additional variation in the process that impairs your ability to detect those very small microbiome changes. So today for the rest of the talk, we're going to present a few key concepts and studies uh, showing impact of variation, mostly in collection and storage. The first being a short-term stability, so an under seven days storage evaluation of fecal microbiome samples, a long-term 60-day uh, hold stability, and then finally showing reproducibility and replicate consistency. I'm also going to describe a few key tools we're developing and using here at DNA Genotech and Diversigen to mitigate some of this bias and variability I've just talked about. So the first is our sampling devices for collecting biological samples. Uh, they are available for a range of biological sources. There's vaginal, saliva, uh, salivary, and gut, for example. And they've all been very well validated and tested internally, as well as through external studies and academic and clinical research publications. So for today in particular, I'm focusing on the Omnigene gut collection device pictured here, uh, which is used for the collection and stabilization of fecal samples for microbiome studies. There are a couple of key design features that make this collection kit unique. Uh, you could see the pictograph on the left. Uh, the first one being the volumetric chamber included in the cap. So this allows to uh, for the user to collect a consistent amount of stool each time into the sample collection tube. And then the second one being this metal mixing ball inside the stabilization liquid, uh, which allows for complete sample homogenation at the time of collection, leaving you with a fully mixed and liquid sample at the end of collection. After collection and processing, every study we're about to present use metagenomic shotgun sequencing to profile the microbiome. In the literature, even today, most studies are still using 16S amplicon sequencing. It's cheap, it's very accessible, but it comes at drawbacks for microbiome profiling in that there's low resolution and low accuracy. On the other end of the spectrum, there's deep whole genome shotgun sequencing. It's far more costly, but the benefit is that you can draw out novel strains and genomic assemblies um, from those data. Bridging the gap, we have shallow shotgun sequencing. So the benefits are the cost reduction without loss of accuracy for genomic, taxonomic, and functional profiling of the microbiome sample. So throughout these studies we're about to present, we're using a mix of booster shot, shallow, shallow shotgun sequencing, and traditional deep sequencing to profile the microbiome. And with that, I'm gonna pass off to my colleague, Christina, who will share the first study. All right. Oh, great. Hello, everybody. I'm going to be going over the short-term stability and short storage study with you today. So the objective of this study was to assess any shifts in microbial communities of fecal samples held at four different environmental temperature conditions. Samples from each of 19 donors were aliquoted and held under one of four temperature conditions. These temperature conditions, as shown here, were minus 80 room temperature or a foam cooler with ice packs, as well as um, room temperature, but held in the Omni gut chemistry. These were held for seven days is what, for short term stability and samples were and aliquots were taken for T1, 2, 3, 7, as well as T0 for a comparison. We compared these samples in two major ways. We focused on donor to donor comparisons by group. An example of this would be donor 19's room temperature samples to donor 14's room temperature examples. We also compared any variation within donor aliquots. So that would be donor 19's room temperature samples to donor 19's minus 80 degrees sam samples. 
So we're specifically looking for any individual taxonomic shifts and major trends, and those will be reported in the following slides. We started with looking at donor similarity. We created a PCA plot to observe how similar each sample was to every other sample. Here you can see that each of these clusters these are actually all uh, single donor derived samples. So every temperature hold aliquot is within one of these for every donor. Uh, we noticed that donors tend to cluster with themselves specifically rather than by a temperature or a time point, saying that donor to donor variability is less or is greater than within donor variability. We restructured the PCA plot to view it as a dendrogram to look at a finer resolution of, this, of these relationships. Again, we see that donors form their own clusters. There were two outliers. They're shown right here. They were technical replicates at T7, and they just had a much, much lower recount than the rest of the samples. So we removed them for further analysis. To a quick overview of the taxonomy that was found in our samples, we created a taxonomic bar plot. These bar plots sh will show the top 10 most abundant bacterial species within the fecal samples. We created these bar plots across time points, we grouped them by temperatures, as well as donor specific. Relative abundance of the top 10 most abundant taxa are pictured in these bar plots, whereas the rest are grouped into a remainder. You'll see that on the next slide. Taxonomy is as expected for stool samples, and you'll also see that the microbial profiles were well conserved within donors. So here's the bar plot for donor 13. As you can see here, we start at T0, and we took time points at T1, T2, T3, and T7. So here at T3 for room temperature, there was a shift in the microbial profile and we decided to take a closer look into these to see if they were significant because this isn't very extensive and we need a little bit clearer of a picture. So moving on, we, this is the evaluation of our room temperature held samples. We took raw fecal samples and held them at room temperature for seven days. Extraction and diversogen booster shot sequencing was performed at five different time points. As you saw in the previous slide for the bar plot, it was T0, so the raw sample, as well as T1, T2, T3, and then finally at T7 for our short term. We considered T0 as the baseline for all comparisons as to what the fresh samples microbial profile would look like. Aitchison's distance metric was used to measure the change in the micro composition between these time points and for donors. So here is the plot that we ended up with. So you can see here that we plotted and grouped Aitchison's distance metrics from T0 to T7. Each point represents the Aitchison's distance metric from a donor sample to that same donor's sample at T0. For example, this dot is showing the distance between the microbial composition of T1's sample, or donor X's sample at T1 compared back to T0. It's important to note here that T0 is made up of the technical replicates taken from the sample at time zero in order to look at the expected variation per donor's composition at, the, at time zero. Here it's also very nice to note that you, for these room temperature stored samples, there's a steady increase in Aitchison's distance for each day, suggesting that the microbial profiles are definitely changing as you're storing at room temperature unstabilized. We also held our samples in a cooler filled with ice packs for seven days. Once again, there was five time points, T0, 1, 2, 3, and 7. Again, T0 was considered as the baseline for all comparisons and the Aitchison's distance metric was used. These samples were specifically held in a cooler with ice packs put in it rather than in just a cooler just on ice. 
We also measured the temperature across the seven days to check for how it fluctuated within the cooler. So here's a similar plot as we saw in room temperature. Again, we can see that there's a steady increase in variability based on the Aegisons distance. Whoops, sorry about that. The Aegisons distance from T0 to T7. Once again, each point is the Aegisons distance between a donor's sample at that time point back to T0, and T0 are technical replicates. Moving on, this is, we're at the endpoint evaluation. So for this, we looked at the raw fecal samples compared to the fecal samples after seven days of storage. Again, we used T0 in the raw samples for the baseline comparison and the Aegisons distance metric to compare how the composition changed. Instead of just one temperature group, we compared four groups. So we compared room temperature, ice pack storage, minus 80 degrees Celsius, as well as the OM200 chemistry this time. Here's our similar plot to what you saw before, but this time for just the endpoints. So each point in this now represents between the change in Aegisons distance from T0 to T7. We use the T0 replicates once again to show the expected variability at, of fresh samples for each donor. We note here that minus 80 samples are very similar to the raw samples. Also note that samples stored in the OM200 chemistry are very similar to the T0 replicates. It's also very important to see here that the ice pack samples and the room temperature samples are almost equivalent in the amount of change and do not reflect the microbial profiles of the T0 replicates. We'll move next to our technical replication evaluation within the short-term stability study. The extraction replicates at T7 were taken for minus 80 and OM200 samples. The purpose of this was to ensure consistent sample composition between aliquots after seven days of storage. So here again, we show the three extraction replicates per donor taken at T7 for samples stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius or within the OM200 chemistry. The Aegisons distance of extraction replicates are similar between the two storage methods. They're very on par, so you would expect the same amount of variation between aliquots from an OMD200 stored sample as you would from what would be considered your gold standard minus 80 sample. To determine which taxa were affecting the change of this sample composition, we performed an ALDEX differential analysis. The threshold for significance was based off of Welch's t-test, where we used the p-value of less than 0.05 and an effect size that was greater than the absolute value of 0.5. The differential analyses were performed at three taxonomic levels for each temperature hold levels were order, family, and genus. I'll be speaking specifically about the family level today. This is the differential plots for the ice pack samples. This is at a family level. The red dots you see here, there are any tax specific taxa that change significantly. They met the 0.05 threshold for our significance value. Please note the y-axis range of negative one to three in this plot because in the next plot, you'll wanna take a look at the OM200's axis. This is just the ice pack plot because the room temperature plot is very similar to this. We have many families that are changing significantly in that, those samples as well. This is the differential plot for the OM200 stored samples. As noted, the range in the y-axis on this log scale is much smaller than for the room temperature or the ice pack samples. Here, instead of negative one to three, we have negative one to 0.5. Additionally, there are no taxa 
that met the 0.05 p-value threshold, and therefore there are no red dots on this page. The minus 80 version of the differential plot is very, very similar to this as well, suggesting that they are on par with each other. So the taxa with significant change, specifically the families. To look at these, you took two families that showed the significant change between the T0 and T7 time points. So we have lactobacillus and enterococci. They both fell within the significance threshold and effect size threshold as well. Families only showed significant change in the samples stored at room temperature or in a cooler. As I said before, there were no taxa with significant change for samples stored at minus 80 or in the OM200 chemistry. We created plots looking at the abundance of these specific families. Here on top, we have the ice pack stored samples and the room temperature stored samples. Please note that all of the plots are on the same axis. For ice pack samples, we can see a definite shift in lactobacillus as well as in the room temperature. Whereas for the OM200 stored and the minus 80 stored samples, there is no shift. This would suggest that if you hold your samples with one of these two storage methods, you won't see an increase in this family. Additionally, you can see that the Enterococcusia family had a very similar change in growth. There's a little bit lower of an axis here where they fall. However, the changes were considered significant in room temperature and ice pack samples. Whereas for the minus 80 degrees samples and the OM200 samples, there was no changes found. So we spoke about two families, but these are the overall taxa that changed. So as I said before, there were no significant changes when held at minus 80 or within the OM200 chemistry. So this is just a reminder of what could potentially change if you held your samples at room temperature or stored them within ice packs in a cooler for seven days. Finally, we're going to look at another study that was done by Gorzelek et al. So here, a homogenized stool sample was stored in a domestic freezer for 30 days. DNA was extracted and used for qPCR to compare bacterial taxa abundance. All bacterial taxa tested showed some change in abundance by day 30. So here as well, you can see that similar to the slides I just showed you, we have Enterobacteriaceae and Lactobacillus. So at the genus and species, levels, but we still see those shifts after seven days, which is important to note. Finally, I'd like to summarize these results. Storing raw fecal samples in OM200 chemistry is equivalent to storing samples at negative 80 degrees for seven days. Using a cooler alone to ship samples is not enough and it will result in shifts in your microbial community composition in your fecal samples. These shifts will be similar to what you would see if you left your samples out on your counter for seven days. So shipping samples collected at home using an ice pack and a cooler will not stabilize your samples. And now I will pass the slideshow back to Jean. Thank you, Christina. Um, just before we move on to our other studies, our long-term storage and stability and reproducibility that I mentioned, we're going to pause for a few questions. I think Molly has a few queued up. Yeah, thanks, Jean. Um, I'm actually going to work in slightly reverse order from uh, some of the simpler questions. Um, you had some box plots up. What's the y-axis for them? might be difficult to answer having moved past them. <laughs> I'm not sure at what point that was asked. I assume probably during uh, what Christina just presented. Yeah, um, just towards the end. Oh, yeah, towards the end. So that's the Atchison distance. So what it is, it's a distance metric. It's similar to a Bray Curtis or a beta diversity metric. So in every single case, a sample is compared either to a later time point or to another sample 
and the distance is a direct measure of how similar those microbiome profiles are. So are you looking at the same taxa, the same taxa distribution, or is there a measurable change affecting it? Okay. Um, we have a couple questions about the O200 samples. Were they stored at room temperature or negative 80? Yeah, that's a great question. They were all stored at room temperature. So okay. every OM um, OmniGene gut device was stored for room temperature for the variable time. Um, the only ones at a different temperature change were the minus 80 samples that were immediately put into minus 80 and held for that time period at that temperature. Okay, uh, we have a question about shallow shotgun. You said strain detection for known dominant strains is greater than about 1%. Can you explain a little bit about what you mean there? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I, I don't like doing this, but I think I'll defer that for now. Um, there's okay. additional explanation for where those values come from and that sensitivity. And we're absolutely happy to talk about um, any of that in more detail possibly afterwards. Okay. Um, I'll just, you... sorry, I'll just add to that as well. When, when we introduce shallow shotgun, it's uh, approximately two to two and a half um, million reads, just so you have a sense of where that lies. Um, deep shotgun or traditional metagenomic shotgun would be upwards of, say, 10 million, for okay. example. I have two more quick questions and then one more in-depth one, and then we'll let you move on. Um, what days did you for taxonomy classification? Uh, sorry, I think I'm... I missed a little bit, but I think you're asking for taxonomy annotations? Yeah, uh, sorry, what database or reference database did you use for taxonomy vacation? Sure, um, we we actually use multiple. Uh, Booster Shot has a database that is available and is used for the studies, but we, because these are internal um, R&D studies that we really want to test the extent of the products and the methodologies, we use other options as well. Um, so some of the data includes different um, mappings to RefSeq database, so a custom pulled RefSeq, and um, one known as the ProGenomes, which is a curated set of reliable or supposedly reliable genomes for reference. Okay, uh, two more, one hopefully quick one here. I never know whether these answers are going to end up quick or more extensive. I believe this was asked during the, the first data that was presented. The comparison data are based on 16S. Um, so all the data from the studies are, they're not 16S, they're all metagenomic shotgun sequenced data. Perfect. So full, full shotgun. Okay, so last. I, I, Sorry, go ahead. I, I just, I hope that's what that refers to, but any data we're presenting is shotgun. Okay. Um, last one of this first sem set of questions. Could you comment on the efficacy of different assemblers to assemble the short reads? De novo assembly is great, but there's no way to know if the assemblies produced are actually accurate, which aggravates uh, the problem further for much more diverse samples, such as wastewater. Any thoughts would be great. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, Great question, a great comment. Um, this is outside the scope of what we're presenting today, but obviously something on our mind because there's challenges, there's different methodologies in the field for how to do this, how do you extract something de novo and actually validate it. Um, we're, we're looking at these things internally, but I, I don't have anything in that presentation today as to what we're using or recommending in that sense, but, but I think that's a very important note that uh, when we're dealing with fecal samples, as we're talking about today, there's a lot of reference databases that make it more annotatable. There's well-known strains and genomes available. Whereas when you're moving into other sample types, wastewater, for example, environmental, uh, clearly lack of references are gonna impact that additional variability that you're gonna get from trying to assemble or trying to map. So I would I would layer that on into this, this whole message of if you're trying to detect changes, it's, it's going to be increasingly difficult if you are unsure or don't have a, a standard to kind of compare to. Okay. With that, I will go back on mute and let you continue, and we'll continue to queue up questions for uh, towards the end. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for everyone who's, uh, who's submitting questions and thinking about these things. Um, 
So flipping back, I'm going to uh, continue from where Christina just left off. Um, she presented data of a time course of seven days and how samples are affected um, beyond seven days. So we have evaluated the effects of long-term sample storage and stability. Let's get that to continue. Uh, so in the same study that Christina just presented, uh, we looked at the changes over 60 days. So these are samples, the exact same donor samples that were extracted or collected and then further extracted downstream in the same conditions. Um, in the case of the omnigene collected samples, they were held at room temperature for 60 days. Um, and compared back to the other conditions of unstabilized or the minus 80 gold standard. And just to orient you again, because there was a couple questions on this, so you'll, you'll be familiar with these plots. We're using the Atchison distance to measure the change either between samples or between samples at different time points. So as Christina nicely presented, our comparator is always normal sample variation, which is the first plot here. If you just go and take multiple samples from a stool and sequence them, this is the amount of variation or change you would expect to get just from that process alone. When we look at the next few comparative plots here, so this is omnigene gut collected samples and omnigene gut after 60 days, um, they are on par and no different from normal sample variation, meaning that, oh, I'm sorry, that jumped ahead. Um, meaning that using the collection device is not introducing any additional technical variation. And then in comparison to the gold standard minus 80, so held at minus 80 for 60 days, um, they are, again, not significantly different, maybe slightly better, but in this case, we'd say at least on par with the gold standard. In extreme contrast, unstabilized samples after 60 days show a massive shift in their microbiome profile and this is approaching the between donor differences here, which are the largest differences we'd expect within these sample types. So when I talk about effect size, it's really important to think about these changes in this way. So these are the same data plotted with that differential analysis that Christina described. And in any case with OM, there's no additional variation that's being measured here. All the points before and after collection and after time series are not introducing changes that we don't expect. The minus 80, again, performs well. And then in contrast, here's something that introduces a lot of change. So room temperature samples that are unstabilized introduce significant changes and significant variation into the study. And for visual reference, here's what effect size looks like when you have uh, a large effect on the left. So the between differences are big, you can easily separate that these two groups are different versus an effect size that's closer to one, meaning that the difference between the means of these two um, taxa is different. You can see the, the medians are different, but they're so overlapping that that variation is obscuring our ability to evaluate whether they are truly different. So I'm gonna jump gears slightly to our final study, which is evaluating reproducibility. And when I say reproducibility, I mean ensuring that you're getting a good representation of your sample from every aliquot you take. So this kind of technical reproducibility, as I call it, was compared uh, within our own collection devices with extraction methods that we recommend. And with a, for contrast with a competitor collection procedure and a competitor extraction, um, what's really important is that every sample, every donor sample that was input was extracted in triplicate to be able to measure the effect of that technical variation. So I'll first show the per donor um, replicates. So each donor is along the bottom. If we hone in on sample eight, again, we're plotting that magnitude of change within each group that I just described. And then additionally, you could see the variability added. So in every case, and especially in donor eight, the amount of change and that spread of difference between the three technical replicates 
is much, much smaller than alternate methods, and in some cases, extremely smaller than some donors. This is the exact same data. I've just plotted it by group to show you that, um, again, our OmniGene collection device with recommended extraction provides the least amount of change, and that increases as you choose a different extraction method. On the right is the measure of coefficient of variance between those three replicates for the donors. Uh, so in every case of a donor collected with OmniGene, uh, sorry, not in every case, in nine out of 10 cases for every donor collected with OmniGene, the, the coefficient of variation between those three replicates I described is under 5%. And in contrast, if a different extraction methodology is chosen in the second point or a different extraction and collection methodology, the variation increases massively. And so in this case, only three of 10 samples are below that 5% coefficient of variation. And if that doesn't convince you, this is an additional study, um, an additional set of donor samples that were collected Similarly, five technical extractions were performed. Um, the PCA plot shows that there's extremely strong intradonor clustering. So those technical replicates are very representative of the donor. And if I plot it in the same way, showing the, the difference in the total microbiome, we have normal sample variation as expected here. And with two different methodologies of extraction, there's no additional technical variation that's added that exceeds that normal sample variation. And of course, it's far, far less than between donor differences. So why is this important? Um, the problem with microbiome studies is that you're usually not collecting three to five replicate samples. It's usually not feasible. So if you're only using one Alicot sample, you want to ensure that it's fully representative of that whole microbiome sample. Uh, so we attribute this high reproducibility and low technical uh, variation in our device to the sample homogenization and that form factor I described earlier. Um, in addition, I didn't show this, but there's higher DNA yields and higher DNA um, extraction amounts from the device, meaning you can go back to these uh, samples if you want to resample. And you can know that if you take a second sample, it's gonna be still representative of what your initial sample looked like. And we're not the first ones to point this out. There's literature out there that suggests that homogenization is one of the key factors in being able to reproduce and reliably get a representative microbiome sample from sequencing. So going back to that bigger picture, we've shown that these different steps in microbiome sampling and processing workflow can introduce differing amounts of variation. And there's three key takeaways from this. Um, the first one is that error is additive. So every step that you input from your sequencing to your extraction, any kind of processing, if you add replicates, you're adding more potential error into the final, um, the final output. That's in contrast with most true microbiome effects are very, very small. And so that effect size is impacted by all that underlying variability. Some of it you can't control, the biological variability I described. Um, therefore, you do want to try to reduce as much as possible by making the right choices for collection and processing to not impact that final output that you're trying to evaluate. So we've talked a lot about reducing that unwanted bias and effects of improper collection, storage, or extraction. But I want to hit off a couple more points just before I close off. Um, firstly, at-home collection. I mentioned previously, this is a, a current need, but a general need to be able to have easy and accessible at-home collection. Um, the OmniGene Gut device has very clear and validated user instructions. And if we look at the impact of that, the ease of use leads to higher usability scores, higher compliance, and higher sample return rates, which means that you have a better chance of getting back the samples you need if you're um, 
if you're looking to add home collection solutions. And these are across different sample types and different, uh, different scenarios. Uh, we did focus a lot on sample collection quite a bit, but I also want to briefly highlight that through Diversigen, we do offer expertise and services for sequencing and data analytics. Um, and that's to help you make the right choices and the right analytic decisions to get the most out of your data interpretation. And of course, you do want that whole picture all the way from generating that hypothesis through the study design, sample processing, and being able to choose the methodology choices that help drive that impact. And I'll close off here um, before we take any more questions, if there are any. Um, viable at home sample collection options provide opportunities and access to samples by removing a lot of the logistical challenges of cold chain and increasing that user experience and compliance. So even as Christina presented, uh, solutions that are ice packs and coolers or home freezers are not sufficient to reduce those changes and bias that are introduced in your sample collection. They can occur very rapidly. We showed within days, one day after collection. Um, others have shown within hours and those impact your downstream discovery. So we have a unique design offering of the Omnigene Gut Collection Kit and it ensures that the sample is collected volumetrically, you're getting the same amount of sample, and that it's properly homogenized meaning that you're getting a more consistent, a more re reproducible profile. You're reducing that technical variability. And then critical choices in the collection, the sequencing and analytics can reduce some of that unwanted variability and help confidently identify those meaningful biological differences that are extremely small in microbiome studies. And I'll leave, I'll leave with this. Um, if, if we don't get to your question today or you have additional questions or um, want to inquire about anything, please reach out to us. We, we are looking for collaborations. We offer service consultations. We have job opportunities as well. So uh, take a look at those links or reach out to Christina or myself directly. And uh, thank you so much everyone for listening and, and participating as well. Thanks so much. Uh, um, we've got lots of questions, so people get that you offer services. Let's see if we can get to some of the questions. <laughs> um, we'll keep them brief where we can, and we'll go in depth where it's needed. So, easy question. Hopefully, were these packs refreshed daily in the seven-day time period? And, and sorry, I should check if Christina's still there. Um, we're not. We're obviously not in the same room, so I want to check that she's available too. Oh yes, I am still here. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, did you want to take that question? I can take that question. Yes, um, I, they were not refreshed. We did keep a temperature probe in and we checked what happened as they melted or were to thaw out. So it took about two days and the coolers did end up reaching room temperature. Great. Um, do you have any product collect samples and store to over 60 days at negative 80 degrees? Um, so we, we normally don't recommend storing our sample collections in minus 80. It's, it's not necessary and it can also hinder uh, the sample downstream. So we do have well-validated, well-documented collection for longer term um, at room temperature and uh, in colder temperatures as well if there are extreme long-term collections. Um, so I can certainly redirect or send any additional information if, if this person is looking for um, the specifics of that. They're also available on our website too. Okay. Um, I'll assume that answered that and assume that also answered your question, Monica, and leave it to you to follow up if you want more information. Um, hang on, let me move back up here a little bit. I don't want to miss people's questions. Have you evaluated viability and recovery rate of the bacteria at different time points? That's, um, that's a great question. Um, we, we certainly don't want to ignore uh, in microbiome studies that um, there's so much value in being able to recover viable samples um, or having alternate methods for evaluating maybe culture studies. In our products, the sample is totally inactivated. It's, it's completely designed for that. Um, this is 
part of the reason that it works so well in freezing that profile. You're getting a very consistent, a very um, stable and neutral sample. So it's not designed with that in mind. Um, that said, we, we have thought about this, of course, of being able to have downstream ability with collecting samples for other applications. Okay. Um, very technical question. When you say ice packs, do you have, mean actually freezing the samples at negative 10 degrees and in this frozen state, samples changed almost at the rate of RT change or do you mean putting ice packs in with the samples? So I can take that one again. Yep. Uh, so they weren't frozen. They were placed inside of a cooler on top of ice packs. So okay. I hope that answers the question. I hope it does I'll too. Just, like I'll extend on that, sorry. <laughs> No, no, uh, that's great. Uh, great question. Um, the whole purpose of the study was really to simulate, uh, say, a lab or a clinical environment where samples are being collected throughout the day. They're thrown into a pre-cooled cooler, so the cooler already contains ice, and then they're sitting there for maybe an indeterminate amount of time. It could be hours, it could be days. Um, we, we specifically looked at days with the idea that some samples would be either shipped or transported somewhere else. And that was the uh, preservation offered, was having the ice packs remaining in the cooler and the cooler remaining sealed. Um, does OmniGene gut support microbial viability? I, I think you said viability. Um, yes. Yeah. So I think that's quite similar to the previous question. Um, so again, the answer is no, because we're ensuring with the sampling that you are freezing that profile. You don't want any changes. And because of that, it, it, there isn't a viable recoverable portion of it. Um, if, if, other, if this is a question that other people are asking, I can certainly um, direct that to the right place as well, if, if you're thinking about those things. Okay. Um... Can this be used for fecal samples taken from rats? <laughs> Everyone has an organism of choice. It's not always, <laughs> not always human, right? Right. Um, I, I, I'm not going to answer that only because I'm not um, in a position to say if that's been tested and validated. Um, I, I think it's a great question and I, I'd absolutely love to follow up on that. Um, by far and away where, you know, our impact on this device is for humans because it's really designed for human hands <laughs> to be able to add the sample in and um, homogenize it, as I mentioned. And um, that's really where a lot of the research is going. But uh, now you've got me thinking about rats yeah. as well. <laughs> okay, good. Um, Seven days for shipping is perhaps a bit extreme. How much variation at T1 and T2? Yeah, um, so Christina did show some of that data and if, if she wants to comment too, I'll welcome her to jump in. Um, seven, seven days could be extreme, um, but we did include day one, uh, day two, day three, five, I believe. Sorry if I'm forgetting um, incorrectly. It was day one, two, and three. And yeah, we did one, see two, that two, there three, was, yeah, yeah, we did see that there was a change after one day and two days, um, but it was a gradual and consistent change with the cooler. So Jean, you okay. can go ahead and add more to that as well. Yep, no, that's great. And I think just to reflect your comment that after uh, two days, the cooler still reached room temperature. So at that point, mm -hmm. the sample had no longer had any uh, cooling preservation. Okay. Um, we still have 19 open questions here. So we're working through them. Um, <laughs> appreciate it, ladies. How about storing samples? And you may have already answered this for short or long term weeks or months in omnigene tubes at negative 20, negative 80 in room temperature. Is there a difference? Yeah, so the, I did show a 60 day, so that's the two month storage. Um, as I mentioned, we, we have all our data, all our product descriptions and validations online. Um, there's definitely support uh, to have longer term storage. And if, if you're looking at options of that, we can certainly provide additional information. Um, the data today was up to 60 days and there was absolutely 
no variation or no change compared to a, a T0. So that's an immediate collection um, into the device. Okay. Um, the distance matrix used, matrix used in the research work, can it be used in other research of varied domains? Yes, absolutely. And I highly, highly recommend it. Um, my personal research career has been developing, testing, and applying these methodologies for different microbiome studies. Um, so my past work included using this. So this is the Atchison distance. It's a compositional approach, which is a very, um, it, it's a current trend in microbiome. It's been around for a while, but people are looking at it more and more because it provides a better way of evaluating changes without having the effects of um, proportions affecting your data. So that's the problem when, if one thing in your sample changes, one thing increases, say from 10% to 20%, then everything else in your sample, the ratio of all the other taxa or genes are affected. So the Atchison distance gets around that problem. Um, it's applied to any type of microbiome, any type of sequencing study. There's lots of literature out there. And it's used, or variants of it, are used in other omics types too, like metabolomics um, and proteomics, where you have that same ratio effect that you're trying to mitigate. Uh, so uh, it is uh, far more reaching and useful than just the applications we're showing today. Okay. Um, I may butcher this next question, so I apologize, Zachary. LDX2 can be conservative in terms of the number of significant taxa associations detected. Were other differential abundance tests used to see if any additional taxa were differentially abundant between time points? Yes, uh, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so the tool is ALDEX2. Um, it's specifically meant to be conservative and um, where it performs really well is reducing false positives. And so if depending on your goals in your microbiome study or your analytics, um, there's kind of two approaches. You can try to get as many differences as possible, knowing that your false positive rate, so the number of those differences that are not truly different is gonna be high, or you can try to reduce that false positive rate um, at the expense of sensitivity, which is what the, the question asker had, had pointed out. Um, we very deliberately chose to be conservative. We have looked at other differential tools and um, a lot of these data that were shown today, they go back to the lab. We um, do more targeted approaches. We've done qPCR, for example, to, to further validate or to look at different cohorts. Um, and the nice thing is that in this very um, you know low false positive, a lot of these predictions are highly um, conserved, they're, they're able to, we're able to see the same differences repeatedly um, in different sample cohorts or under different conditions. So it's really providing uh, an increased confidence, I think, in knowing that what we're testing are true, um, we can call them biomarkers, but true markers of change, rather than having to weed through uh, a lot of predicted changes where many of them are just going to be false positives because um, because of the underlying data and, and the problems associated with it. Okay. Um, can you envision any issues with storing the OM200 at four degrees Celsius in the medium term prior to DNA extraction? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to deflect because I don't have the information right in front of me. Um, I, I believe that storing at four degrees is okay. I um, would definitely, again, direct to our, our documentation to ensure and, and talking to our product experts who are extremely knowledgeable and can tell you every answer to that. Um, I apologize that I don't have a full answer. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, 
Have you looked at the importance of homogenizing the whole stool sample prior to sampling in the omnigene gut and its impact on variability? Yeah, so I think um, I think that's a great a great question to ask because when I said homogenization in the data we were showing, this was within device homogenization. So this is after taking a scoop of sample, it goes into the device. Um, the device is shaken to really distribute that sample. So all that data, when I say technical variation, is from within that device. The alternate is um, taking that raw sample and and I think this is what the, the question asker is implying is homogenizing it first before input. So we have looked at that a little bit. Um, most people, uh, and I'm kind of speaking for the world, but most, most people in most studies we've encountered, that's not the standard practice. Um, there's some, I guess, squeamishness involved. If you could imagine for sample types, in some sample types, it's not even logistically feasible to do some kind of manual homogenization before input. Um, some of the data I showed had that sampling variation that was measured. And although there is sampling variation, and of course there's, there's spatial variation in a, in a stool sample, um, it depends on your study design of choice and what you're trying to evaluate. We at least know with the amount of material that's being collected into the device that it's less susceptible to some of those sampling variations that other methods are. So if you think of something like a swab or a very small amount, you're, you're going down that bullet chart that I showed in the beginning and you're reducing that amount of input so much that you're introducing a lot more variability. Um, so that's the, that's the benefit of being able to do a direct sample, not having to do any upstream homogenization and then knowing that whichever sample you collect, it's gonna be reproducible within what you've collected. I hope, I hope that kind of addresses what was being asked. Uh, I hope so too. Uh, I <laughs> apologize, we have about 18 more questions here, but we are just over uh, time here and I know everyone's got other things to do and, and competing demands. Um, Jean and Christina, I want to thank you. I encourage everyone whose questions that have not been asked, and I apologize, to get in touch with the ladies directly. Um, and they, I'm sure they will be more than happy to talk with you about your uh, questions. Thank you all for joining us. And again, you can get the replay of this at the conference website, microbiomeconference.com, under the webinar tab. Great. And thank you so much, Molly and John and everyone tuning in and asking questions. And, and we really hope to hear more from you. Great. Thank you, everybody.